So good afternoon uh, to our participants here in India. Uh, my name is Hannah Ondako. I'm head of IP at EDPC and I welcome you from the next edition of Thursday Talks. And this is I think third or fourth uh, session in this program, uh, which I personally feel has been very successful. And today we, are today we are going to talk about importance of patent drafting. Before we proceed further as usual as per the custom, I would like to pass the word to Mr. Ashish Garde to give us our working remarks, remarks from MAGIC. Ashish sir, over to yeah. you. Yeah, good afternoon and welcome to this fourth uh, episode of uh, Thursday talk. Uh, and today we will be discussing importance of patent drafting. And today we have with us uh, Mr. Tanmay Mittal, uh, and he would be elaborating on this particular uh, subject uh, to quickly give uh, background of MAGIC. MAGIC is a Section 8 company promoted by members of Chamber of Marathwada Industries and Agriculture, CMI, which is an apex uh, body of uh, industries in Marathwada region of Maharashtra. Uh, MAGIC is recognized by Maharashtra State Innovation Society and Ministry of uh, MSME. We are active since 2050 and currently we are incubating around 28 uh, startups and we are mentoring uh, another 138 uh, startups all over India, most of them uh, virtually. So for today's session, we have uh, our partner institute, uh, CSMS uh, Polytechnic College, and I welcome their team as well for this uh, particular uh, session and I am sure today's session would be very useful for all the participants. We have arranged this uh, series uh, specially as part of uh, MAGIC's CSR partnership with Tata Technologies wherein we are hosting a virtual exhibition of uh, startup ecosystem on CII platform at ICON 2021. I appeal all the attendees to do visit this uh, virtual exhibition also post uh, today's session. Uh, you will get opportunity to interact with uh, many exciting startups uh, who are participating in this particular uh, exhibition. Uh, over to you, Hannah. Thank you, sir. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a fourth uh, session and we have been trying to convey or talk about different topics. Uh, which uh, small startups or SME might need when they start a journey towards being big successful ventures. Why we chose the topic of patent drafting is because this is um, very important for uh, SMEs or startups to understand how well written patent can actually or badly written patent can uh, protect or slash damage their their invention and that's why there was the thought behind it to actually uh, talk about the patent drafting because this is something which might not be necessarily known that generally people just about talk about filing the patent but the way how the claims are written you know what are the impacts of uh, writing the claims how the claims actually protect the innovation this is very important to understand because then you end up paying a lot of money for patent which might not be actually usable if it's not written very well. And to talk about it a little bit more, we have again Tanmay. Tanmay join us. We already had the first session in the series with him when we talk about IP due diligence. I'm really happy that Tanmay agreed to talk to us again about, about this topic. Uh, so Tanmay, welcome aboard again. <laughs> <laughs> Tanmay is very Anna, brave no be because he, he contracted COVID, <laughs> so he was uh, he's uh, probably not feeling the best. So thanks for joining us, despite the despite the your no positivity. <laughs> no problem, Anna. and yes. I and I think today's uh, topic is uh, well chosen. So uh, hats off to you for choosing such a topic because this is actually a very sensitive topic that. Most of these startups, SMEs, you know, they're, they're trying to understand it because every time uh, they have some invention, the biggest roadblock that they have is how to file it. And then deciding how to get it drafted, whether the drafted application is good enough, these sort of questions always, you know, they are there in their mind and they're not able to, you know, get a good answer. I, I'm hoping in today's session, we would be able to provide some pointers to them, basis which they at least make an informed decision on 
you know how they should go about drafting whom should they choose how to get it done what all things to look at so i think yeah this session would be very good for them thanks a lot for that uh, and i of course encourage all the participants you know to ask us questions we had a lot of questions uh, last time which is you know to encourage the discussion so when you're listening to us please do ask us you know uh, whatever is on your mind or anything you need to clarify so i'll just kind of kick off the, the, the technical part of the session so we might all know or maybe not depending how how well informed as startup or SMEs we are about the patents as such that patents have actually several or the patent application have several uh, parts you can say you know it starts from the bibliographic details then there is abstract a complete description claims and drawings so this is what the patent application actually consists of so now Tan uh, Tanmay which one is the most important part of the patent <laughs> okay uh, I think uh... I think all of them are uh, very relevant and very important. Uh, but since you're asking which is the most important part of it, then I would say claims because that uh, essentially, you know, uh, you know, th that essentially tells you what is the scope of protection you have. And again, it is a bit intertwined because this is a single application. So distinguishing parts would not be a wise way to look at it. But claims definitely are the most important. However, accompanying them, your enablement, drawings, they also, you know, they are equally important. But yeah, if I have to give an answer, then I will say claims are the most important. Mm. Thanks, Tanmay. Uh, and as you mentioned, I think generally what we, what we say when we talk about claims, that claims is the virtual boundary, which... Yeah. Uh, is drawn around the invention and essentially what yeah. happens where you know uh, either in the cases of infringement or case of actually commercialization that the claims are actually literally look at word by word you know so this is something which companies or startups have to be really you know uh, careful about because this is actually the crux of your of your application so before we you know proceed to application is there any prior step which we should do you know you think okay i have a patent i know what it is or i have an invention i know what it is and i think it is novel you know there is nothing like it so as a, as a pro <laughs> what would you say to, to young inventors and startups to do before we actually proceed to drafting uh i think uh, um the first and the foremost step is to be informed of what already exists. So, uh, you know, as you mentioned that various aspects of uh, all various uh, sessions, then we have abstract, we have, you know, background information, then we have title of the invention and, you know, so forth, many things are there. When we are writing in a patent application or we are when we are drafting a patent application, then the most important thing to understand is that uh, you have the right context in mind. Because if you are claiming uh, anything which is out of context, then that can be construed for multiple things. You know, you can go and claim a hydraulic cylinder, but where is that used? What is the boundary of that hydraulic cylinder? Where does it find application? And to justify that, you will have to do a little bit of, you know, prior art research to understand if there was any problem that was there because of existing hydraulic cylinders and your invention is trying to solve that problem. Now, that is from the drafting perspective. But when you are taking a decision of whether to go for a draft or not, the first step there is to go and do a prior art search immediately without thinking anything. Because drafting a patent is an investment in itself. And when I say investment, I'm just not talking about money. It is about time also. Because a lot of energy and time goes into thinking about what to write in the draft, what to claim, how to enable various things in the draft. It, it's a big exercise. And before you get into that exercise, before you get into that investment, you should be sure that your, inve that your investment is a bit risk-free. And to ascertain that, you need to do a prior art search. And that prior art search will highlight anything and everything that exists, which might pose a threat to your invention during the prosecution stage. So it is better to be informed in advance rather than re uh, regretting later. Because once you have filed the application, then you have shot the arrow. You have no other option but to either get it prosecuted or you know you'll have to abandon it which would be a loss of your invention so it is always advisable to do a prior art search in advance get a thorough one done you will understand what are the gaps you will understand how you can modify your claim you can understand how you can mold your patent application in a way that it sees minimum prosecution actions and gets a speedy grant 
that's what the prime intention is once you're filing it you should get a speedy grant that's why you're filing what is the point of keeping an application in the prosecution stage for tens of years which is essentially half the life of a patent so be prepared look for prior art formulate a strategy on how to draft based on the prior arts go for it you will get less prosecutions and a speedy grant yeah i think this is this is a very important point because we have seen it you know all over again when sometimes um inventors believe that whatever they have invented is completely new and uh you know they might not be aware that on the other side of the world uh, you know there's somebody else who had exactly the same idea so it is obviously essential and also in the inventive process you know when you are going through that you can always use uh patent data as a good source of information the way where the technology is going as well as check, you know, whether what you are thinking about, about the future feature of the invention, whether that's actually new. So I think it's a good point that we mentioned it. I maybe also add to it that uh, these days there are a lot of free resources which you can use, you know, from Google patents, from EPO, Espacenet, obviously Indian Patent Office and uh, VIPO, Search Engine Patent Scope. So there are a lot of free resources as well, which you can use in case they don't have a subscription to kind of patent databases. Uh, Tanmay, would you, I mean, add anything to that? I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, this would be a very lame example, but uh, I think it is uh, pertinent over here because, you know, you, um, and, and with no offense, I'm saying this with no offense, but from a very practical thing that you cannot ask a cobbler to do a barber's job. You should not do that. Your job is to invent. Being startup people, you are managing a business. You are, you know, focused on your tech. That should be your focus. Your focus should not be IP. Leave the IP to professionals. Ask them to take care of your invention. Get a professional search done from them. You will save time. That time is worth more to you as compared to the time you invest in identifying, say, a prior art search or doing a comprehensive study on patents. I don't think so. Always the better approach is utilize your time the best you can because that is what your capability is and then leave these things or outsource these things get it done through there are several organizations in india i mean you can choose anyone you can choose the one which fits your budget as well that that should not be a problem but get this exercise done through professionals because they would use professional databases to give you results which may, you may miss while doing searches on free databases because you have limited knowledge about how to perform searching how the operators work and those sort of things so yeah getting priority is essential you want to do it on your own very well if you have that time that will do knowledge leveling for you increase your awareness level in the domain but before you are making a decision get it done professionally and it doesn't cost that much i mean yeah. prior art search is something which really does not cost that much yeah i think it's good to have a mix and match approach where you know yeah. some part of it people can do on their own and then when you kind of finalize it before you go for this other investment which is the actual drive uh, mm. draft you can approach professionals Obviously, so, uh, as, Hana, uh, mm -hmm. Hana, one point to it. Sorry, I interrupted you because you mentioned this. So I thought maybe I'll let uh, everyone know that uh, a standard way to think about it is that you should not, you know, outsource morning inventions. So what morning inventions are? They are, you know, uh, they are the inventions that come to you in the morning when you get up and you think of doing something new. They are not yet <laughs> finalized. They are not concrete. They, they lack technical data, but it's just a rough idea. So when you, whenever you are having a morning invention, don't go and commission a search for it. Do some searching on your own. You know, that would give you understanding of what is happening in the domain, what sort of inventions are there. That will help you nurture that idea, you mature that idea. And once it is at this stage, when you feel that the idea is matured and now you wish to make a decision on whether you should go for a patent or not, that is the time when, you know, you can seek for professional help. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. I like I like that the concept of morning invention. <laughs> I'm sure we are all in the shower thinking about what we can improve. So um, since we, I mean, we obviously spoke about the cost because for all of us, you know, that the cost obviously one is the official charges and one is the charges, you know, for the for the patent drafting. And I'm sure that a lot of people might have idea, particularly small startups, that you know, having a patent draft, it's kind of costly and they think, oh, you know, I know I'm the inventor, I can do it maybe myself. So as you, as a, as a, as an expert, I'm sure you would probably say that this is not um, a good idea. So what, yeah. what's your opinion about inventors doing their own, own <laughs> drafts? <laughs> Again, I will say, you know, don't ask Cobbler to do a barber's job and that, that stays here as well. I mean, uh, let me, let me try and give an example on it. So 
for example i mean uh, writing a patent is is i mean it's not something a um, sort of a miracle i mean it's just practice it's just knowledge that's all i mean it's not it's not magic that you know you are paying somebody to create magic out of nothing it's it's not like that anybody can write a patent draft if you know english you can write a patent that's not a problem the problem is why are you writing a patent because you want to commercialize it or maybe protect your technology in case you are not able to achieve that end objective of filing a patent then there is no point filing a patent altogether and for that end objective you have to have that basic knowledge of how to write a draft so you know writing a page in english is not difficult i mean anybody can do it but you know writing that in 20 pages that is difficult then get it done through professionals i'm pretty sure every it difficult to extend it beyond few pages maybe two or three and that is where the importance of getting it done through professionals comes in because they use their knowledge experience to create embodiments they use their knowledge and experience to create that boundary of your draft which takes you from two pages to 20 pages the better you explain the better are the chances for the claim enablement the better are the chances that you will get less prosecution the better are the chances that your invention would be able to identify infringers correctly because identifying infringers is again something which would depend on the information that is being written in the draft i mean most of us would be thinking at this point that you know uh, what is there to write i mean if i have invented something i have to just explain it that is fine but that should be just one embodiment of it you should have several other embodiments that explain the same concept through an alternate style of working through an alternate way of working so that you add depth to your application you broaden it up so when when an examiner or when an attorney is looking at your claims when he is trying to have the broadest interpretation of that claim there should be sufficient material in the patent application which enables the attorney to visualize the broadest possible application of the invention so these are the things that that i believe need practice <laughs> it needs experience and practice so yeah if you want to write a patent yes you can but always go you know always try and get the broadest thing and the most uh, depth possible so yeah my answer would be to get it done professionally but if you want to do it fine i mean you can go ahead and do that mm. i think uh, from my experience when i usually saw the drafts written by the by the inventors because of course in a in a world of uh, ip because patent specification is technically legal documents and obviously if we if there are any lawyers sitting there they would tell you that the language is extremely important you know so there is a particular language how these yeah. claims have to be expressed so they make sense and particularly as you said when it comes to identifying infringement or you know when it comes to also licensing or commercializing your invention elsewhere so having the language right you know not just the technology behind it is of course of course very important and since we speak about the language you know um this is again something which uh, i mean we hear as patent professionals all the time when people speak about global patent application with this idea that i can have a pattern which fits it all so i think uh, we would like to dispel some misconception here so uh tanme my question is to you <laughs> are there any different styles of patent drafting for other countries you know not just india let's say us or the eu or epo or elsewhere so um, and 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 let me answer this only on the surface level because i don't want to go uh, too deep into it because if i go into multiple dependency antecedent basis then this might become confusing for the audience so i'll try and uh, explain it in layman terms for people to understand so Uh, drafting is uh, a patent draft is a techno legal document as hana mentioned you know just few seconds ago and getting the language right is very important of course one more thing to understand over here is that there is nothing like a global patent patent is a very territorial thing any sort of ip is a territorial thing i mean copyrights you can exclude but almost everything else is territorial then may you turn uh, you muted yourself yeah there you go 
my apologies so uh, by uh, when i say that it's a techno legal document so it means that you know uh, there is a legal aspect to it and that legal aspect is generally governed by the regional laws where the patent is protected so when it comes to style of writing then there are few minor differences when it comes to us europe or maybe japan or korea or other geographies and these differences are basically in the style of explaining or enabling the claims in the style of writing the claims so for example few uh, european attorneys would prefer the use of language characterized that i mean hana can explain better from that perspective because she is she has a good experience from that side so from ep perspective there would be a slight change in how you write the uh, claims as compared to us then there is also uh, a difference in terms of technical advantage i mean uh, while writing in europe you know you have to uh, bring out that technical advantage uh, us it may not be a necessity but it is always beneficial then you know uh, then you can also uh, explain about multiple dependencies but in us it is not allowed in us if you have multiple dependencies you will get office actions on that so there are few legal things that are preferred by these geographies and uh, a person who has ex that experience i mean i cannot uh, take you through a class on that right now but uh, but there are differences to answer it in a very short uh, and concise manner there are differences in the style of writing but 80% would be the same 20% would be the regional thing that would be the difference between us europe japan or other countries i mean number of claims us allows 20 claims Europe allows only fifteen. India only gives ten claims. Then, in the claims, you can have all three methods, but in Europe, you cannot. You have to have a system claim. So, these are some of the differences that are there. Thanks. Anna, anything you would like to add? To yeah, I, I think in principle, in principle, you are right. You know that that there is, I think, always kind of useful when you know as a. And I know sometimes for people it might be overwhelming when you have the invention have. you know all you do with your ipr have some sort of overarching uh, strategy to it you know don't do things just randomly because certain decisions to can ma make your life easier you know so let's say if you know that you want to go only to europe you know or you want to go only to us and it's only to markets in the us you want to do then you can tailor it at the beginning you know in a particular manner if you think okay i might go to more jurisdiction again the the, the professionals would help you tailor your application in a particular manner so my only comment would be whatever you do you know don't do it randomly have a certain thought behind it also in the way i have my invention i want to file it it's novel which are the markets which can be interested in and have a little bit more substance you know not just blindly file something and then find out that when you go to prosecution there and there you know you have to change things around that's going to cost you a lot of money that you find out you cannot really you know license it whatever it is So having a bit of thought in the beginning can save you a lot of pain and probably money at the end. So that would be just my my thought about it. Also, when it comes to comes to drafting, and I think that my this is generally also where you probably ask your clients when they approach you for drafting. You probably one of the question you ask them, where do you want to go next? Isn't it? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. That is true. And and a very good piece of advice from you, Hana. And yeah, I mean building on what you said last. uh that is an important consideration because that helps you at least create a strategy behind writing that application i mean uh getting prosecution done is also a strategy i mean for europe you would you know we know that for europe you would get to office actions and it would go to a hearing we have better chances over there so how we would try to have a broadest possible scope there in the claims so that after two office actions we are at the optimum scope and you know getting it into hearing and getting it granted but in U us there is no limit to office actions you can get as many office actions so it totally depends on the geography i mean and yes being informed about it in advance and then planning your application makes sense that that's a, that's the best way forward Yeah, and I would also add to it. This is a novelty for you, those who kind of plan to go to Europe. Uh, I think by the end of this year or early next year, the U European Unitary Patent is coming in force. So it means with single application, you can validate your you can validate your patent essentially. and i think it's 18 countries so not all epo states right now will be part of the unitary patent but that will make the application coming to europe much easier because that process of validation in different epo states will not be there so 
Uh, this is again something which might change the ball game uh, in the future when it comes to European patents. And I'm sure Tanma, you guys are on the ball on that. So because we are slowly running out of time, um, I proceed with the last question because of course we talk about the claims and we talk about the um, specification. So what does it actually mean when we talk about that claims have to be enabled by specification, you know, and why is that important? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very well, uh, you know, a very good question, Hannah. So, uh, uh, when we say enablement, so claims are not very descriptive generally. I mean, claims are just written to give an introduction about what you are trying to protect. And the enablement aspect of it ensures that the way you have written summarizes or makes anybody who is reading that patent understand why that claim was written. I mean, just to put it in a layman word, I don't want to get into the technical side of it, but on, on the layman perspective, if a person is reading your claim and he's not able to understand anything, then he would go to the description and try and make sense from the description. If the description is um, has substance enough to explain the claim, then I would say that would contribute to the enablement of the claim. Also, people for claiming can claim anything, but you have to get it enabled in the specification. Otherwise, uh, I mean, it, it's about perspectives. I mean, look at it from the perspective view. Uh, if I am reading your application, if there is an application A, I am reading it, Hana is reading it, and you are e reading it. All three of us can have a different perspective towards that claim when we read it. But for us to understand it, we can always refer to the specification where you would have described what you are trying to do and how you are trying to claim it. So in a nutshell, your enablement of the claim gives depth to your application and it should be so descriptive and well understood that anybody who reads your patent understands what you are claiming and how you are claiming it. Why is it that uh, part A is connected to part B in this manner? Why is it that part B is performing a certain task because of part C? I mean, you have to enable everything. Hana, I hope I'm not confusing people over here. Does it make sense or? Yeah, it does. And I would probably add to it. I think it's uh, also making sure that I don't write something in my claim and I write something completely different in my specification. Different you know? than the so pretty much if you imagine it, uh, if we give an example, your claim is, you know, when you build a house, so your claim is like the, the four walls around it and the, the specification, the source are like the internal walls. So at the end of the day, it makes all sense, but the claims give you the broader, broader you know, boundary, and then you explain it for the in your specification. So as you said, the little tiny details you would not put in your claim, but it has to be obvious from the specification. And also specification, when we talk about prosecution later, in case you are missing certain novelty um, features, you can pull it out from your specification and narrow your claim a little bit with that particular feature so yeah that that i would i would say so it's of course and, and yeah. uh, go on and, and enablement hana we can also tell them that uh, enablement uh, not it is just not about specifications that enablement has an important thing to do with the drawings as well so the mm -hmm. so the enablement of the drawings is also necessary in light of the specification and the case yes. so it, it should not be there that you have created a pattern drawing and where you have mentioned five parts, but in the specification, you are writing about 10 parts. And yes. in the claim, you are talking about seven parts. This will yes. not have, this will not do. There has to be a consistency in everything. Whatever you have written should be enabled through drawings as well. If you have 10 parts in the specification, then those 10 parts should be there in the drawings with proper leader lines and numbers so that when a person is reading, he can correlate that if you're talking about part number 101, then what is 101 in the drawing? How it connects with 102? How do they work together with 103? So. That is very important to understand. Mm. And I would also add to it that, uh, for example, in Indian Patent Office, for instance, you know, if you are adding a more content to your to your claims, it has to be written specification. Let's say sometimes what happens that um, certain elements might be left out of specification and they are in claims or they are very briefly mentioned, you know. So then Indian Patent Office or some offices are reluctant to mm. 
you know, in case there are certain novelty or whatever criteria which you need to meet. So unless it's sometimes, you know, more described and it is in your drawing, but they tend to be reluctant to add it, you know. So yeah. it is really important. And I know you might be all thinking, well, it's, you know, obvious that whatever I have, I describe. But sometimes, you know, when, when you write the, 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 the document and uh, one might think that you include everything, but at the end of the day, it might not be the case because it is quite complex exercise. Yeah. I mean, to... Uh... Uh, explain it with a very, very uh, lame example. I mean, it just came to my mind when you were speaking, Hana. So I thought I'll just let everybody know so that they can correlate better. So for example, I'm just giving you a very lame example that, for example, uh, there is a, a painting of a horse on a wall and you have to write a draft for it. So if if me and if Hana, we both are working on the same draft, then I can write it in a single line saying that it's a horse's painting. That can be the pattern draft for me. But Hana can say that, you know, uh, there is a white canvas. On that white canvas, there is a background color, sky blue in color. And the lower portion of the canvas is colored in green. On the lower portion, there is a mammal standing with four legs in the shape of this. And, you know, the mammal has a long mane of hair growing through the backward side of his head where uh, the ears are positioned oblong to each other. So both of them are describing the horse's painting. You understand the difference now. I have just said that it's a horse's painting. Anybody else would just look at it and say, yeah, it's a horse's painting. That's what you have written. And that's how inventors think about it. That my invention is about component A working with component B. What else do you have, do you have to write about it? But when we look at Hana's application, now you understand the difference. I mean, that is how you write about it. If, if there is a component A, how that component A is made? What are the various elements in component A? what how those elements are connected how they are operating together and how it is working together with component b what are various elements of component b so that that is where the enablement bit the adding depth to the draft bit comes into picture then the then the cherry on the top is when you write more embodiments on it you know so that people get the horizon to imagine people try and envision it from multiple angles so yeah i mean we should keep that in mind when we are looking at a pattern mm. draft or getting it done or you know doing it so that is where the enablement bit and adding the depth of it comes into picture thank you tanmay we have uh, one question here and please all of you you know uh, if if you want to ask more questions about it do ask us so uh, mr sanjay is asking two patients have the same product but different way in drawing and specification which slightly vary what are the chances of acceptance as a professional, I would say I'll have to look at the claims yes. before I go ahead and commit anything. Uh, but again, I mean, if both the products are same, then it would totally depend on what they are claiming. Yes, there is no other way. I mean, there can be two identical products. Somebody is claiming the head and the other one is claiming the tip. So, you know, there is a difference. So looking at the claims would let us know. Yeah, I think oh, sorry, I'm not sure that would have helped. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I think th these this kind of because they can be, I mean, essentially, if you say that the product is the same, because when we are looking at pattern, there has to be the novelty part, right? So you always judge it is irrespective. Would you obviously we, we spoke about the writing and proper language and everything, but the technicality is that the te technology behind it obviously has to be also different. So there might be different way how to express things, but at the end of the day, as an engineer, where you look at it, um, there has to be kind of technical difference. But as as Stan may say, to kind of give concrete um, answer you know, you have to look at the, the, the writing, you have to look at the drawings, you have to look at the claims and then kind of make this a decision. There is one more question. Um, we are a registered startup and we have developed a mobile app relating to reverse collection of waste. We would like to discuss uh, patent registration. Right so now. this is a bit tough one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the question. Okay. Um, I think um, with the you want to comment on that. I think uh, if if the question is from the perspective of whether we would get a patent on it or not, then I feel the answer to it that uh, we'll have to get a prior art search done to be sure if it would be there or not. But if the question is on how to get it done, what all to do, then I think that is something which we'll have to take offline. 
because in this session it would uh, not be prudent to discuss about your invention before yeah. it is <laughs> before it is uh, protected so i would advise not to uh, disclose everything over here yeah. we all are sharp minds over here let us yeah. uh, get into nd and then discuss about the technology and then see what we can do about yeah. uh, and other thing is for the for the for the software or computer implemented inventions there are of course uh various criteria in terms of novelty and event mm-hmm. step and so on so there actually has to be really seen what exactly the invention innovation is and how it interact with the software and what is the technical effect and so on and so on so it does require a little bit more discussion than uh than that so do get in um tell me if you want to um drop your drop your um, yeah. um email there then you can you can get okay. in touch no problem Sure, so, sure. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. So there is a from uh, uh, Manju Tripathi. Please share views on Markush claim. It pros and cons, tips, precautions, and one should take uh, whilst um, using Markush claim. So uh, I would have to apologize upfront because I am a mechanical engineer and I have done drafting in mechanical only. So I know about mechanic and elect, uh, mechanical and electronics, but not on the Markush side. Uh, but to answer your query, if you can drop me your email address over here, or you can you know give me a call, I'll connect you with my senior draftsman on the life sciences team side, and he understands this pretty well. He writes these drafts and he's aware of it. So I can get it answered for you, but I may not be able to answer it right now. Hana, do you have any views on that? I have exactly the same problem as yourself. I am myself an aeronautical engineer, so my all pattern experience pretty much comes from either mechanical or ICT. So, uh, and I think this is something which we probably didn't mention in this course that patterns are indeed very uh, technologically driven, and um, you know, person with a particular technology experience should be writing particular patterns. So let's say, although I'm an article engineer, I would never be able to write any biotech patterns or any pharma patterns because you basically don't have the technology background. So this is also very important to bear. And I think maybe this we, we didn't mention because we, we spoke quite generically that whoever drafts your pattern has to have the technology uh, background, you know, to be able to do it. So the person skilled in the art I would never be a person skilled at art for pharma inventions because I know nothing about pharma, right? And I'm sure that a pharma person would not know about mechanical or electronics or ICT. So that's something which which is a very important, very important as well. Um, we have a what time? How much time we have? I'm not sure. We still have a moment. There is a question. One more question from. Um, Chimmy, we have registered patent and, and we are producing product. Uh, what is the respect of the patent or shall we have loyalty? I'm not exactly sure um, if you are a patent owner and you're producing your patent, it means by having a patent application, you restrict others from using the technology. And if you think you can license it to somebody, you can l- look for another party and license the technology to them and have royalties from those uh, from this technology, any any other thoughts than my on that? I think uh, you know uh, the first line that you mentioned was that you know they have a patent, uh, and uh, many people are producing the same product. So this is a clear case of infringement. In case you have that patent granted, then the first thing that you should do is check for infringement. Uh, and you know if you identify people who are doing that who are infringing on your patent then you know you can send them a legal notice asking them to either cease and desist or start paying the royalties else you will take them to the court yeah that should be the approach over here this is interesting question here from uh, Nantkum and I think uh, it obviously will pose certain uh, I don't say controversy because we do hear it sometimes from certain technology companies and uh, he or she is saying Sometimes patents require so much disclosure to protect that you end up in giving all the details for somebody else to get an idea. And on that, they can build and make another product. How does one avoid the situation? Work with professionals. Don't work with freelancers. That's the small answer to it. 
when you will work with big organizations you will get ndas in place you will get indemnity you will get a lot of legal things in place through which you can assert your rights whenever you see somebody copying your invention or doing something these organizations will also have uh, iso and uh, other gdpr policies compliant with them these people will also have information uh, need to know basis so all these things they are important i mean if you are having that fear that you know your disclosure the person that you are working with is not from uh, is not uh, i would say compliant to isms iso gdpr then don't go ahead and disclose your draft to them you need to have those checks in place that's it that is called being basic awareness i mean the way we get these ads on television that please do not share your pin with callers on telephone please don't share your aadhar number or don't do kycs on you know messages or something where it is it is just like that don't fall into traps work with organizations that are reputed that have legal things in place that have these ndas uh, th- these have these uh, uh, isms policies and iso policies certified go with them get your application drafted hana your thoughts my thoughts i would approach it from slightly different angle so essentially if we look at uh, what is patent as such you know we know that you disclose the technology to public domain which are right they said so but at the same time the particular authority of the state in our case in india is in the patent office grant an exclusive right to sell manufacture export import whatever it is that particular invention and as we see in technology these days everything is pretty much um, you can say we are using the te- the technology which is already existing we are all using it to invent something else you know and in patents than may would would agree with me you know you have forward and backward citations when people do cite their patents anyway so what i wanted to say is yes there is a full disclosure yes it will be out there and yes in the future there might be somebody who will make that particular invention more novel you can say but mm-hmm. the way how it is at that particular point of the time when you have your product this is yours and then patent give you rights to protect it you know in case somebody copies it you can go and sue them for infringement yeah, so I, mean, I, thought, it, i thought it is from the writing perspective <laughs> i thought it is from the yeah, drafting I mean, perspective yeah also you know sometimes what is my experience with certain smes particularly the european ones there would be certain inventions where uh, companies would prefer to keep it as a trade secret now mm-hmm. that would depends on the nature of your invention so let's say if you have an invention which is big water treatment plant the the likelihood that somebody can you know copy it easily is small then for you it's very easy to keep it as a trade secret but if you have a some sort of small element or small invention let's a small machine watch or whatever which can be easily reverse engineered that it's much more advisable to actually file a patent any thoughts on that on my this yeah, trade I mean, secret versus versus the patent when it comes to disclosure and the way how the inventors look at the disclosure i think uh, so for trade secrets there is no tangible protection that you get because there is a secret in its name trade secret it will stay in force till it is a secret if there is something that you can keep secret then you know no need to file a patent on it keep it secret but in case you feel that you know it can be easily discoverable or reverse engineered then go and file a patent i mean again uh, how to put it i mean understand it from this perspective that what is your end objective of that invention i mean i've been talking about it through, ent- through the entire session that you should be clear about the end objective of your invention are you making that invention to you know make betterment in the world are you trying to make that invention so you can you know uh, stop others from doing that thing or are you trying to create your invention for monopolizing things are you trying to do your invention for not preparing a product but you know selling your technology and getting revenues like dolby does i mean they don't have a physical product but they are one of the biggest firms in the world everything that they get is from licensing revenue so what is the end objective of the idea and whatever be the end objective you have to choose like that so for example coca cola they have a trade secret for their secret formulation they don't want world to know about it it's as simple as that they want the competitive edge on it they want to be the people who are monopolizing it so there is no patent on it they have kept it secret for hundreds of years they will keep it secret for the next 100 years 
and that's it that's that's to it but in case you know you have come up with an invention which has a technical utility and solves some problem that a lot of people are struggling with go ahead file a patent license it out or yeah. make it open like tesla did so that people can learn and you know get advanced i think i think to sum it up because this towards the end of the session that at the end of the day and this is what we mentioned earlier it's about the strategy you know strategy for your business strategy for your innovation strategy for your product we have seen all sorts of variation you know on the market from somebody as uh, tanu mentioned said tesla which you know the public everything i have uh, had a chat with european company they they were manufacturing cement for instance and they come up with the trade secret you know and they license the technology to somebody else because they are sure this kind of composition can be reverse engineered you know so there are various things then you have people who are extremely uh, pro patent you know so there are endless variations to it and as, as Stanmaya and myself have been saying it really depends what what the objective is you know and look at the strategy look at the you know financing look at the you know markets of your product and having kind of uh pro, like a more thoughtful process behind it um yeah that's probably way forward so we are running uh, <laughs> slowly out of time uh thank you everyone it was i think really nice interactive session and we have a lot of question which is always great to see at the webinars <laughs> these days so thank you to all of you for asking so many questions and of course tanne for joining us despite your <laughs> covid <laughs> diagnosis <laughs> and i i probably pass over to uh, ashish sir if you want to add anything um for this session before we before we call it a day yeah it was indeed a wonderful session and thank you tanmay and hana for having this uh, conversation and addressing uh, to the queries of the participants uh i take this opportunity to thank uh, csms uh, polytechnic college team also for joining us uh, and all the other attendees for today's session uh and look forward to the next session uh, next thursday uh, is that right hana on yes 17? next yeah yes next thursday we have a session i think it's on internationalization uh and again this is for the for the you know uh, small startups and smes which are uh planning to enter european market there will be with my colleague ankita tiagi and uh, there i think is one more session on taxes and there will be one more session with me on brand building towards the end because i think our program finishes at the end of february isn't it yes 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 yeah. so thanks a lot uh, to the ebtc team uh, to cii team for such a wonderful support and cooperation in hosting today's session thank you all thank you very much and see you soon yeah yeah <laughs> see you soon looking forward to having you next time bye